you again for uh, just taking time out of your week to come and worship with us today. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to grab that out and follow along. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4 today. There are a few kind of underneath the seats. If you don't have one, um, they've kind of probably been moved. But inside of the Welcome Center out in the lobby, if you're leaving and you need a Bible and you don't have one, feel free to grab one of those Bibles. There's a, they're light blue ESV English Standard Version Bibles. You're welcome to grab one of those and take with you. Or if you know somebody who doesn't have a Bible, just take one for them. You're welcome to take them. They're gift Bibles. We like to give them away. I have more in my office. If you don't find any there, let me know. I'll go dig one out for you because I love giving away Bibles. So just make sure you got something. Uh, iPad, iPhone, whatever you got, you can use U versions, a good version of the Bible. Uh, if you need an app, and we're going to be digging in, as I said, into uh, Mark chapter 4 today. Now, one thing as I read through the Gospels, uh, you know, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, one of the interesting things that I see as I read through there is you find Jesus asking questions over and over and over and over and over again. Um, in fact, he asks over a hundred different, different questions uh, throughout the Gospels. And I uh, looked at one last week, and we're going to look at one this week, and we're going to be following some of these questions on through all the way into Easter. And he just continually has questions. And in fact, um, you would see frequently in, in the Gospels this pattern where, where even if you ask Jesus a question, instead of giving you the direct answer you were probably expecting, he asks you a question in return. So he, he, he uses these questions uh, frequently. And, and our question for today is, is a very simple one, and you see it up on the screen there. It's, why are you so afraid? And this sermon today is for those of us who might be struggling a little bit, maybe in the middle of one of life's trials, right? Maybe you're in the middle of some sort of difficulty. There's some sort of storm going on in your life. And we're going to see Jesus ask this question, why are you so afraid? Let me give you a little context for Mark chapter 4 so you can understand where we're coming from. And in that story, uh, we're going to see that Jesus has been teaching, and he's actually teaching in a boat, if you know the, the background of this story. And, and this boat's probably been pulled up on shore, and he's standing in the boat, and there's been people crowding around, and he's been standing there talking and teaching and preaching. And finally, he says to his disciples, hey guys, uh, it's time to go, right? Uh, let's, let's leave this crowd. Let's go to the other side of the sea. And, and so we will see in the story this boat that was his pulpit. It's going to transition into being a sermon illustration of his, so to speak. And so with that in mind, let's dive into Mark chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 35 through 41. Uh, after I kind of dig through those a little bit, and then we'll break them down verse by verse. And so here's what Mark's gospel says to us. Verse 35. It says, That day when the evening came, Jesus said to the disciples, Let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there were other boats also with him. Verse 37. And here's where it kind of starts to get interesting. It says, a furious squall, right? A tremendous storm came up. And the waves began breaking over the boat, and so the boat was nearly swamped. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been in that boat before. Okay, um, This was a number of years ago. I was on a trip out in the Boundary Waters. BWCA up north, we all know we're Minnesotans. We know what the BWCA is. And I was on this canoeing trip with some of my good friends. And, uh, well, a few of my good friends and a few guys I'd never met before, but they became my good friends throughout that week. And um, we were just about to leave. We had spent an entire week. Uh, we decided we were going to pick one site and stay at that site and then venture out from that site. And so we hustled out to get to the site we wanted. It was Memorial Day week, so there's a lot of people who go out, and uh, um, it's a good time to get there because there's no bugs. The water's ice cold. Um, I mean, as cold as it can be. I mean, it kind of goes clunk as you paddle through it still that time of year because there's almost ice in the water. But so we got out there, and, and we stayed for the week on an island in the middle of a lake, which was perfect because you didn't have to worry about bears or anything else. We had the whole island to ourselves. It was fantastic. And so we spent this wonderful week there and then did voyages from there and fished from there and all kinds of great stuff. And then... Uh, when time came to come home, we, we were on a big lake, because it was a big enough lake to have an island in the middle of it. Um, we got off that lake just fine. We made it to the second lake. And when we got to the second lake, out of nowhere, we were about halfway across this lake. A, a tremendous squall, kind of like this, came up. 
Now, I'm a big guy. That's pretty obvious. So I'm in the front of the canoe. Now, the other guy I'm with, his name's Randy, and Randy's a, a, a friend of mine. And, and Randy's a much more accomplished canoer than I am. He's been to Boundary Waters probably 40 times. Um, so very accomplished. So I'm in the front, and of course, this is the heaviest weather I have ever experienced in a canoe. Uh, and and I, I'm worried. I got my life preserver on. All of our worldly possessions we have with us are in the canoe with us. And I'm paddling, right? And then... And, and, I'm worried because I, I, the waves are getting, like, I can, I'm looking at the wave, right? It's next to me. And then I can feel them slap in the boat. And pretty soon I can see water starting to come up underneath me. Not through the boat, but in the boat, right? Um, and and it, it begins to worry me a little bit. But the part that really made me begin to worry was, you know, I could mostly ignore this and just paddle as long as I didn't realize what was happening. But the problem was Randy is keeping me really well informed with what's happening. There's water waves coming over the side of our boat, beginning to fill our canoe. So I can hear the panic in this guy's voice who's been to Boundary Waters like 40 times. I can hear the strain in Randy's voice. And I am pulling as hard as a man my size can pull to get us through this lake. Praise the Lord, obviously we made it. We survived. Uh, we, we got out to the other side and... Um, had a long portage, and by the time we got to the next lake, it was like there had never been any wind. But uh, I have been in this boat that Jesus is in today, in this story, where the waves are crashing over and the disciples are freaked out. So, so look at verse 38 here. It says, Jesus was asleep in the stern, up sleeping on a cushion. Which, I don't know about you, but it's kind of a funny part of the story to me, thinking that like there's big waves and crash and he's just up taking a cat nap at the front of the boat. But it says in 38, the disciples told him or woke him up and said, hey, teacher, don't you care if we drown? I can imagine Jesus waking up. He doesn't even bother like to wipe, you know, the sleepy dust out of his eyes or anything. He just gets up. And it says he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. And the wind immediately died down. It was completely calm. And then he said to his disciples, and here's that question, say it with me. He said, why are you so afraid? Guys, I'm on the boat. You see me do some great things, right? Why are you freaking out? Then he says to him, he says, do you still have no faith? And then it says about the disciples in 41, they were terrified and they asked each other who is this right even that the winds and the waves they obey him now I did some research this week and I looked into it and the Sea of Galilee is a very interesting place and I'm not a meteorologist which is a good thing because their accuracy rates are kind of low lately but uh, um, the Sea of Galilee if you don't know is about 680 feet below sea level um, and it's kind of surrounded on all sides by these mountains. And, and what happens there with the weather um, is that very quickly these storms can pretty much come out of nowhere and, and they really, really can hammer the Sea of Galilee. Um, this, this is a, a fairly common occurrence in that area. Now, I've never been to Jerusalem or the Sea of Galilee or Israel or anywhere in the Middle East for that matter. Uh, maybe someday I'll go. But, but I have experienced somewhat similar weather patterns. Uh, I worked in New Mexico at Philmont High, High Adventure uh, Scout Base for three years in the Rocky Mountains of New Mexico. And if you've worked in the mountains, or you lived in the mountains, you know what I'm talking about. It can be sunny and beautiful, and then all of a sudden from the other side of the mountain, boom, here came a storm that you really had no idea was on its way. And uh, one of those magical surprise uh, mountain storms uh, happened to me in 1996. I was the foreman of a work crew. So we were building backpacking trails in northern New Mexico where the scout ranch is located. And we're out in the woods and we're building these trails and we were at the work site. And all of a sudden, just literally out of nowhere, the wind started moving these big pine trees. We're under, you know, ponderosa pines and Douglas firs that are humongous trees. And, and all of a sudden the wind just comes up out of nowhere. The sky gets dark very, very quickly. Crack, bang, boom, lightning, all of a sudden, hail. Hail just like, we didn't even get rain before we got hail. It was one of those kinds of storms, right, where the leading edge was hail. 
and and just so all of a sudden we're standing out in the middle of the woods holding giant you know rock bars which are iron tools and axes and plaskies and maddoxes and all those things my clouds and you know big metal tools in our hands all of a sudden the lightning takes off and hail starts falling and uh it, it, it's pandemonium i i have 14 young men in my charge uh, and that i got to make sure they're safe and we had nowhere to go uh, it was it was actually pretty dire, and I was very thankful. One of the requirements of the job site was at all times you had to wear hard hats, those hard plastic helmets, and literally that was the only protection we had with us because on our work sites we're out in the woods. There's nowhere to hide, so there's no caves we could go to. There's lightning cracking everywhere around us. So you don't really want to shelter under a pine tree. Um, not, not a good choice. And so what we did is we found a huge thicket of bushes and crawled in underneath these bushes so that the hail that was falling, because this, this was like golf ball size hail, the hail that was falling would at least kind of slow a little bit as it went through the bushes as it hit us. So after, I don't know, 10 minutes of hail, um, we kind of crawl out on our bellies from underneath to assess things. And we're, you know, we're a little black and blue and bruised and freezing cold and wet and miserable, but nothing broken and nobody permanently damaged, thankfully, and nothing worse for the wear. So... All right, great, wonderful. Um, just chalk it up as a, one of those interesting life experiences. Um, uh, that, that happens. Well, what we didn't know was on the other side of the ridge, and if we can put that picture up, you'll see it here in a second. Right on the other side of the ridge, so you can see the black ridge. I was on the left side of that ridge. This apparently went over our heads, and we couldn't see it because we were being hailed on. This tornado went over our heads and destroyed the town of Cimarron, New Mexico, wiped it out. There was hardly a building left standing. Um, and we didn't know this for five days until they were supposed to bring us food and nobody brought us food and we were running out of food and finally we were getting to the point we were going to hike in to find our food. And then uh, uh, one of our vehicles came out and said, oh, hey, I guess nobody's come out to tell you because we were not in contact with the rest of the world. That Cimarron was destroyed by a tornado and we've been in town fixing that rather than bringing you food. And so I understood why they were late. Uh, that's very understandable. But, you know, it was one of those life experiences you go, whew, that was, that was close. The storm was bad, but it could have been worse, right? And what's interesting is when you go through these types of things, is that when you go through these storms of life, Sometimes life can be going really good, right? That's the way it was for us. We're working, life was great. And then out of nowhere, boom, the storm happens. I mean, you could be having the best month of your career in sales, right? Everything's going well. You're selling more widgets than you've ever sold before. You're ready to get that, that, that big check at the end of the month. And then you find out your company's starting to lay people off despite you having the best month of the year. Or maybe it's that one of that, you, you've been going through life, right? And things are going really well. Your marriage is just hitting on all cylinders and everything's been awesome and everything's been great. And you've just, you're, 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 you're in love like you were kids again, right? You're celebrating 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Everything's going great. And then you go to the doctor and you get that news. And suddenly... Everything that was going so, so well is gone in an instant. Or maybe you've got kids and your kids have been doing so good. Oh, they've been perfect. Their behavior has been fantastic. Their grades have been incredible, right? You think finally they're on the right track. And then you find out the truth. They've been making some bad decisions and they've just been hiding it from you. When you think everything's going well, then all of a sudden life pulls the rug out from underneath you. You find yourself in the middle of that storm. In fact, what's interesting to me at least, I find this, is that as church people, we are kind of good at hiding storms, aren't we? Some of us are pretty good at hiding the storms of our lives. I mean, some of you right now, just looking at you, everything looks good today. You put on the good clothes, you showed up on time, you drank the coffee like you drink every week. You had the cookie like you have the cookie every week. You said hello to the same people like you say every week. Everything's perfect, right? Looks good on the outside. 
But maybe today you're in the middle of a storm. A storm that not anybody else knows about. In fact, I've even seen it at the point where, where, where people are jealous, right? People going, man, I wish I had her life. And she's going, oh, if you only knew. Guy's going, oh, I wish I had your life, buddy. You got the house, you got the car. And the other guy's going, yeah, you don't know I'm four payments behind and I'm about to lose it all. Some of us go through storms very privately. Some of us right now today might be in the middle of one of those storms. We think everybody has it together. But the truth of the matter is, all of us can relate to this. All of us have felt that pressure. All of us have had those times where unexpectedly the storm struck. Now I want to ask you today, as, as gently as I can, and I pray that you'll be honest, would you say right now, you, or maybe just someone you know, is in the middle of one of those kinds of storms? So many of us, often when our lives are in the middle of the storm, we, we didn't see it coming, right? And we never ever would have chosen this. What I want to do today is from the story here, as Jesus asks this piercing question, is I want to show you specifically two things. Two things for you to remember if you are in that storm or for the future when you are in that storm. Two things to remember and embrace in the middle of the storms of life. And the first one is, if you're taking notes, it's this. It's that you are in the storm with God's presence. You are in the storm with the very presence of our good God. Look at verse 37 and 38. It shows us this. It says, as I read, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. But then we see in verse 38, where was Jesus? Sleeping up on a cushion. See, Jesus was in the boat the whole time. Here's what happens so often, though. And I believe, I believe a lot of us think, okay, wait a minute, right? If I'm with Jesus, there shouldn't be a storm, right? Isn't that how it should be? I mean, I gave my life to Christ, therefore it should be smooth sailing for the rest of my life. Isn't that how it works? It's not how it works. It's just not true. In fact, Jesus himself said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. He says, I have overcome this world. Jesus never promised us if we come to him that life would be easy. He never promised us that our lives might be storm free. In fact, the reality is the very opposite of that. When you move from darkness into light, suddenly you step into the middle of the spiritual battle. You see, Christianity is not a playground, but it's a battleground between forces of darkness and forces of light. And when you step onto the side of light, suddenly darkness is against you. And you will face opposition. And you will face temptation. And there will be spiritual battle. There will be spiritual warfare. And to think, just because I'm with Jesus, nothing should at all go wrong with me, is a distortion of what is truly the way life happens. And it's a distortion of the gospel message. Because in fact... God never, ever promises you that just because Jesus is on the boat that the storms will never rock you. What he does promise you, though, he promises you the storms will not sink you. Hear that. He never promises the storms won't come, but he promises the storms will not sink you. Because God is for you. God is with you. And there is nothing that can take you out of the presence of God. You see, Jesus was in the stern the whole time. He was on the boat. And that is a total game changer. Every now and then, you, when you're going through the middle of that storm in life, and you, things are just, you know, they're getting bad. Maybe you've had this experience, and people are looking at you going, how are you even making it through this, right? You ever been there where people are like, how are you even surviving this? 
How come your world's not falling apart? How come you're not falling apart, right? How come everything's going wrong and yet you still have your whole on? What gives? Why is it in the middle of the storm? You're not sunk. And what you're going to be able to tell them is, I'm not in this alone, right? I'm not in this alone. Just like in the boat. Jesus was with him all of the time. You see, his presence is with me. And he is in my house. And he is in my life. And because he is with me, I can sense his strength. I can sense his presence. I can sense his power. I can sense his comfort. Because Jesus is with me. He is in my boat. Never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. Let me say that again. Never let the presence of a storm in your life cause you to doubt the presence of God. I like to personalize scripture. Things like Psalm 46.1. Take it and say, God is my refuge. He is my strength. He is my ever-present help in my times of trouble. He is with me in my storms. Or how about Hebrews 13.5? Never will my God forsake me. Never will my God leave me. How about Psalm 23? We know that one well, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You see, I'm not staying there. I'm not staying in the valley of the shadow of death, but I'm walking through. And when I'm walking through, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with me. See, God never promised that the storms wouldn't rock you. He promised that the storms wouldn't sink you. You see, He is in my house. He's on my boat. I'm not alone when I'm in the middle of the storm. And I pray today that if you are struggling, you would hear that and find comfort, no matter what it is you might be going through, that you are in the storm with His presence. The second thing, if you're taking notes, is you are in the storm for His purposes. You are in the storm with His presence, and you are in the storm for his purpose. I've got to take a drink, sorry. Think about this. Jesus said this. He said, guys, let's take the boat to the other side, right? So whose idea was it? It was Jesus's that they get in the boat and they go to the other side. Why was he taking them to the other side, you might ask. Well, Jesus was God in flesh, and he knew that on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, that there was a guy over there who had been hurting himself and who had been threatening an entire town. He was possessed by demons, and this guy needed Jesus' help and healing. And so Jesus was taking his disciples to the other side, and he's going to speak healing into this guy's life. And Jesus, being God in flesh, undoubtedly would have had some idea that there's a pretty good chance this storm might be coming, right? And Jesus knew by taking his disciples on the boat and taking them through the storm, probably what was going to be happening. So all of this was Jesus' idea. He knew they were going to be going into the storm. And from that line of logic, we can say that they were not in the storm because they were out of God's will, but instead they were in the storm because they were in God's will. They were actually in the storm because they were right where God wanted them to be. Sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? But I can tell you from first-hand experience, being in God's will for our lives, it can be very, very frightening. I've experienced this so many times myself. And as I've growing in faith, and I suspect if you talk to other maturing Christians that they will have stories that mirror my experiences. I've found that when my life is in the middle of a storm, 
I desperately want to fix it, right? I want to fix it myself. I want to solve it myself. I want to make the problem go away all by myself. Only, I can't do it. I don't have the skills. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the resources to stop the storm. And in my experience, the harder and harder and harder I try to stop that storm, all it does is it tires me and it just wears me out and it frustrates me. And I don't see any improvement on that situation. And it's only, only when I come before God and I see God as my solution do I finally begin to see a light at the end of my tunnel. James, the, the brother of Jesus in James 1, 2 through 4 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now wait a minute, what? That sounds a little ridiculous, doesn't it? James, you're telling me, rejoice in the middle of the storm. That's exactly what James is saying, yes. Why? Well, in verse 3 he says, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Then he says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. In the middle of the storm, it is so difficult to have perspective. But God can use those storms to grow us, to mature us. Those trials of life, they actually strengthen and deepen our faith. They help us to become more mature believers. Sure, we would all love to have a life that was perfect and easy where there was no problems, no trials, and no storms, right? Sign me up. But that's not how life works. The storms we experience shape us. They strengthen us. And most importantly, they make us more usable by God. And even more important than that, perhaps, they teach us not to rely upon ourselves. Because you see, my faith is in the one who's in the boat. And that changes everything. I went through the storm and now I'm different because Jesus was on my boat. In our passage, though, if you're following along, the disciples have not yet gotten to this point. And so they're panicking, right? Jesus, Jesus, we're about to drown. Wake up. Jesus, do something. Right? These guys, some of them are professional fishermen, been on these waters all their lives. They're freaking out. Jesus, wake up. Save us. Do something, right? And I love verse 39. Jesus gets up almost, it seems, nonchalantly, rebukes the wind. I don't know exactly how that looks. Like Jesus gets up and goes, bad wind, bad wind. <laughs> right? Time out for you, to your bedroom. I, I, don't know, I don't know what it looked like, but he rebukes the wind. He calms the waves. He says, quiet, be still to the waves. And the winds, they die down, and it's completely calm. And then Jesus looks at his disciples he looks at him and he says, guys, why are you guys so afraid? As if to say, don't you remember me? I I'm that guy that was opening the blind's eyes the other day. I was healing those deaf ears you saw, right? I'm the author of life and I am with you. Verse 40 says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? This says at this point they were terrified and they asked each other, ooh. Who is this? You know, even the winds and the waves, they obey him. Notice what they called him in verse, 20, or verse 38. The disciples say, teacher, is the word that they actually use. Teacher, teacher, don't you care if we drowned? At this point in their journey with Jesus, he was still just their teacher. Now, what do they call him later, of course? They call him Lord. Here's what happened. The fear of the storm started to grow into the holy fear of the Lord. They all of a sudden went from, teacher, teacher, can you do something about this, to, whoa, did you see what he did? And that holy reverential awe 
fear filled them. The fear of the Lord. And that's a good thing. So a lot of you right now, maybe you're in the middle of a storm. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you're in the middle of a storm, my question to you is this very question. Why are you so afraid? Have you forgotten that you are in the presence of Jesus in the midst of that storm and that he is for you he is with you working all things to bring about the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes you're in the storm with his presence you're in the storm for his purpose so why are you afraid as you get to know Jesus, as he matures you, and as you grow through some storms in life, as you endure some storms with him, suddenly here's what happens. In the middle of your storms, you begin to realize, I'm not in this alone. I no longer need to be afraid. Doesn't mean it won't be hard. Doesn't mean it won't be tough. But it does mean you will never walk the road alone. Your hope is not in the boat. Your hope is in the one who is in the boat with you. You see, my soul is anchored to the Lord. And because he is on my boat, because he is in my house, because he is in my life, because he dwells in me, because he is for me and he is with me, he has not given me a spirit of fear but rather one of power and of love and of a sound mind. So if you are going through struggles, trials, temptations, suffering, pain, hear me today. He is with you. That is the best possible news you could ever hear in times of trial. We are not in this alone. So God,